<laughs> What's up, everybody? Woo! It's hot out here. It's been a nasty week for heat. And uh, my name's Russ. Peace and love to you guys. RWGResearch.com is my website. Some of you are wondering what happened to this big old thing. Well, I'm going to explain to you. Yes, I did get it running. And I'm going to show you how. This originally ran on 360 volt four fa or three phase uh, 460 volts all mixed up and it currently runs on a single phase 220 I'm going to show you how it works and I'm going to show you how I did this and uh, yeah so let's get started um, where do I start all right so during this video I shot a bunch of other video prior to this as I was working on it, but I'm not quite sure if I'm going to incorporate it in this video or not. I'm going to try to keep this short, but there's a lot going on, so let's just get started. I'm going to throw some photographs in this slideshow or in this video. As I describe things, I'll show you. So, let's go a quick description. This is my control box. This is an old panel. And, uh, the control box is all run off of this, which I have built from scratch. Um, let me show you the papers and diagrams that I have basically created. Alright, so this is basically the entire milling machine and all the schematics thereof, okay? Um, basically, this is probably more of a replica here. I'll leave it out. It's got some good information on it. All right, so this whole entire milling machine is running on a single phase 220. Now, the five horsepower motor in the back, I if I can get it open. Hard to see. You can see it. That big boy is a five horsepower motor. It is currently running on this frequency drive. This is a VFD, variable frequency drive. This motor up here originally I thought was a three horsepower. It actually turns out it's only a one horsepower. That's a good thing. It is currently running on this other VFD down here. It's actually a generic PowerFlex 4 made by uh, Reliance Electric, but actually Alan Bradley bought them out, so that's who made it. Um, now, before I get too far, I did want to tell you that everything that I've done in this build okay all the pieces and parts that I used to make this run the only thing I had to actually buy was the 220 um, female plug that is it it's the only thing I had to buy it's running on a 30 amp circuit I'm not for certain the amount of amps it's pulling I haven't actually checked the actual load um, so let's get started everything's recycled this is a variable frequency drive without the interface card on the front. Okay. What's interesting about this drive is that I can pump in a single phase 240 volts and get out 240 volts three phase. Alright, so that's why I use this drive. Now, you might be asking where I got this. This and the drive that's in the unit down here are actually broken. I managed to fix one and get it working. This one still has a logic problem, but it'll be good for spare parts if I burn out something, which I doubt I will. So the frequency drive is fairly hard to see in here, so I don't have a whole lot of light. But you can see there's an interface card right here. That frequency drive was probably the most difficult part of this entire situation. Um, I'm going to explain to you probably with some pictures and originally this drive was broken and it's supposed to run a small servo motor alright let me grab one alright this is supposed to run a servo motor that looks like this okay it's got an encoder built into it and a three phase 460 volt output actually it's two that drive is 220. This is a higher voltage, but this is the type of motor that that's supposed to run. This is a permanent magnet shaft with a three-phase output on the coils, okay? 
So originally, I had to figure out a way. This is where I'm going to throw up some pictures for you guys. I had to figure out a way to get that drive to work on an encoder with a, an induction motor. All right. So originally what I did is just figured out how the drive worked. I finally figured out that the drive had a feedback signal that was more complicated than most and it had a thermal overload. So I slowly tricked the drive into thinking it had a motor and then I actually I took the original motor I had access to the original motor and I figured out how it worked and then I basically built something from scratch. So what I've done is tricked the drive into thinking it has an encoder on it, which it doesn't. It has a digital circuit that I've created to make the drive think it has a circuit. So, originally I was going to use pulse fire and I don't believe it was fast enough and I could not configure it correctly. This is a high speed situation that's going on here. The encoder that's inside these drives has 2,000 uh, 48, yeah, 2,048 pulses per revolution. So one single revolution has 2,048 pulses, okay? Then it's a quadrant encoder, which means it has an A and a B, okay? And they're stepped 180 degrees out of phase. So they go like that, okay? I don't have it drawn. I'll show you in a picture. But this encoder has to be on this drive and it also has a a Z and a Z naught pulse okay so this encoder has an A and A naught, a B, a B naught, a Z, a Z naught then it has a U, a U naught, a W, a W naught, a V and a V naught okay so it has a bunch of different channels on it. Well, I finally tricked it into thinking it had all the other channels but only needed the A, A naught, B and B naught to work. If those are not there it will not work. So I created a circuit after figuring out what would and wouldn't work. I created a circuit all right, that actually runs that frequency drive. It's up in this box. Um, I'll show you. So I went from using the Arduino to using a separate system. And now I get to the point where I have to ramp up that frequency going into that drive. Okay, so. When you turn it on, if it goes full power, it pulls too much current and it trips the drive. So what I've done is I've taken a capacitor, run it into a 555 timer. Um, the what pin was that? Uh, the timer pin. Pin uh, five. Pin five, which is the voltage pin. If you run a different voltage into pin five on a 555 timer, you can change the output. Okay, it actually changes the internal voltages. Well, when I flip this switch up here. It unshorts the capacitor, the capacitor slowly charges, and that voltage goes, it feeds directly into my 555 timer, which creates a ramp. I'm actually creating a um, square wave pulse ramp generator with a single 555 timer and a capacitor and a resistor, um, and then the components to run the actual 555 timer. That's, that's pretty good. So when I flip the switch, it disconnects. The capacitor and opens it up to charge the capacitor and it turns the drive on and tells it to be active. Now here's the interesting part. This servo drive is trying to hold its position, okay? So you have the motor and the encoder. Okay, they're tied together in a solid shaft, alright? When you turn this drive on and you say don't move, it tries to hold the position wherever the encoder is. Okay, so if the motor starts turning this way, the the Okay, if the motor starts turning this way, the encoder is going to go with it and it's going to say, okay, feed me voltage and current to make the motor go this way and hold my position. I don't want it to move. But what I've done is I'm turning the encoder and the drive is trying to turn the motor the other way. Okay, so I'm feeding it a signal and it's actually just sitting there. All right. But it thinks it's trying to fight the other direction. So as the encoder pulses go this way, the motor turns this way. And I just go as fast as I want and the drive will output a frequency at that rate. And I've tuned it to where it runs exactly at 1,000, no, 1,750 RPM, 1,750 RPM. Or it's on the click. Anyway, 
So I'm manipulating the drive to think it's sitting still, but it's actually running at full speed the wrong direction. That's what's happening. Alright. Oh. Yep. I forgot to tell you guys that I also had to completely reconfigure the drive, which took quite a bit of time. And interestingly, you could not create your own motor for the drive, so I had to pick one. Well, I eventually found out that if I started a new drive, I could edit the files and save them, then go back to the current drive, and then it would just happen to show up in the drop-down box. So I actually took a meter and metered the motor with the uh, basically the amount of uh, Henry's and resistance and uh, made sure the drive was calibrated for that induction motor so at least the drive thinks it's running accurately and it will put up to uh, 16 amps for up to three or four seconds and then it has a max of nine amps RMS so that's pretty good that that motor originally runs at 14 amps I believe at uh, 220 volts so um, I'm derating the motor a little bit, but for the most part, it works. Now the other frequency drive um, for the head here is just running under normal operation. I have a forward and reverse switch, a reset button for both drives, and a speed control. Okay, This is a Reliance Electric drive. All right, I've actually got the manual for it. You can find it online. But basically what I've done is I configured this drive to accept a potentiometer as a feedback source as the, as the speed. And I've configured it as forward reverse run. I think it's three wire. And um, then I've got an e-stop up here as well. And what the e-stop does is actually kill a relay inside my cabinet or a contactor. So right now the e-stop is on and it's active. Um, real quickly I've got the circuit board back here which I probably showed you pictures and the circuit board these three lights and this switch run the big motor in the back these uh, this knob and this switch runs the head here and then this is a reset for all the functionality I got a fault light a run light and a power light and then I've got a run light just for this one which I might switch this out for a fault it's pretty simple to change. Probably will switch it as a fault light, actually. So, the, the reset the drives, I just push a button. Otherwise, you have to power them down, which is a waste of time. So, when I flip this lever, this contactor right here turns on. Okay? Which, now I have power to my drives. Alright, you can see there's some red light going on. There's a uh, digital display back there. Now I've got a 24 volt power supply. I'm using the internal internal for uh, internal power supply voltage for this drive, but this one needs an external voltage source. So I've 3D printed a bracket to DIN mount rail a power supply, and of course I had to print some words in there because you know it's custom now this box I'm using has a timer on it see that it's actually running because the, uh, the power is applied anytime the e-stop is not active um, that is running and basically this box used to be a uh, chart recorder and it had a timer in it so I figured what the heck I've got the room <laughs> barely I'll leave it in there I do have a, uh, a fuse for the circuitry in the back um, for the 24 volt, this is just a generic power supply that I took out of something else. 12 volt, uh, amp and a half, I believe. So that's basically how it works. Now, let's explain something. This motor back here, all right, runs on 220 volts, which is coming out of this frequency drive. This motor up here is actually running at 460 volts. And you may ask, actually it's running at 440 because that's what it's rated at. So I just configured that in my drive. But you may ask how I did that. I've only got 220 single phase coming in and everything's three phase going out. 
Well, this tooling transformer right here is a 1 kVA transformer, or a 1,000, a yeah, 1 kVA, 1,000 volt amps, all right? And what I've got is I'm running this transformer backwards. I'm feeding it single phase 220 volts in, and I'm receiving back single phase 460 volts, or actually it's about 480, 460 to 480. Um, so this transformer I have to derate by quite a bit because I'm running it backwards, but I'm getting my voltage out of it. So that power is coming back down, and I'm center tapping the input, so I'm getting 120 volts back, and that runs my counter. This uh, power supply actually is 220 volts going in, so it's directly fed past my contactor. So this, dr this drive is actually accepting a single phase 460 to 480 volts depending on the power coming in but there's the label on it and then on the because I'm this is a what is this a three horsepower this is a no um, doo -doo -doo -doo, two horsepower okay I'm running a single horsepower out of this thing but I'm using a two horsepower drive if you maximize your drive um, you can run it on a single phase and the reason is is because this has a DC bus inside so you run AC in and it gets converted it doesn't care if there's a single phase or if there's three phase it's just a matter of how much power is being put in depending on the phases so these phases um, basically it, it converts it from AC to DC and it doesn't matter so this drive likes that it has a certain voltage on the DC bus side of things. It doesn't care what's going into it. That's how I'm getting away with doing this. Now, if I pull too much current by going uh, at a high at a higher speed than it's rated um, on the drive and the uh, motor, I should say, it pulls more current than this drive can handle. So, I've actually configured this thing to run from 20 hertz all the way up to 140 hertz, and I can configure that up to, uh, I believe. 240 hertz or so but that's plenty fast twice the speed rating I figured would be okay um, the encoder feedback signal cable goes into this drive that I've got up in my other box this is all internal except for the potentiometer that runs it this does not have a feeder a encoder feedback signal it's just a dummy drive it just puts out whatever you tell it to do but this one has to have that feedback signal because it's engineered to, to run on a servo motor, not what I'm doing. The other thing I did was I have fans here, 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 because this box is so small and I've got so much electronics packed into it that I need to move a lot of air through this thing. So what I've done is I've 3D printed a couple of covers and I will be gluing these on these fans so that I don't get debris in my box. And then I'll probably end up putting aluminum tape out there, even though I engineered this to slide in and out of here. See the slot right there? So I've engineered it to slide in and out, but I'm probably going to end up putting aluminum tape around the outside. And I'm just going to glue these on here. If I break them off, I can just 3D print another one. So I've got two single things for the back. They just go in here like this, and one for the front. Um, I can explain all these cables really quickly. I got quite a bit of cables, so let me shut this door. And I only have two belts out of the five on there because I'm not running at full power, and the belts just take up more tension, and I don't need that. So I just have a single, a single plug here. I'm gonna leave it plugged in. I gotta have a make a cover for this yet because I don't have one for the size of box I used. Um, I was going to mount this to the wall but I decided since I've already got it connected I'll leave it just like this and then spool it and hang it on the wall then I can take this cord and run it anywhere in my garage and uh, I've got 30 amp uh, 240 volts so that's kind of nice to have. But basically this single cord okay, just goes right into my box and it goes directly to that control relay okay so that control relay feeds power back out to the transformer 
Then there's actually uh, like eight conductors in here, I believe. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six of them in here. So I'm pulling 220 back out of here and 460 back out of here. It goes back down to the drive and then feeds both of these drives. Um, well, the the two uh, four, 240 volts goes directly to this drive, but otherwise this drive gets the 460 volts. Uh, then the the drive for this one just got a single cable up there, and then I have a piece of flex that actually came with this machine. Um, different style. I have to put a bracket. I broke it off on accident, and that just runs up here to my control box. Now what's cool is this control box actually swivels, so when I turn this or do stuff, I can move this out of my way. It's kind of nice. I do not have labels on this stuff yet. But basically, you've got forward here, for the big motor in the back, I've got my run light, my power light, okay, and then you've got reverse the other way. Then the head here, if I flip it. And it's actually on the slowest speed setting. I've got speeds right here. All right. And that faults out when I slow it down that fast. Alright, so I've actually got speed control by turning this potentiometer. And I've got reverse. So if I'm tapping holes or something like that, which you probably can't do with this particular style. Um, if I wanted to go this, if I wanted to make this thing go fast, usually I'll leave this in the middle and then my speed control will be enough to control it. But you're kind of limited on torque for what you're doing. But this is basically high speed. And of course I can run it slow. Now when I turn this on, when I turn this off, this has uh, what they call uh, uh, braking. And it's injected into the motor and it actually counteracts what's happening. So I've turned on braking so this, basically so it stops. It isn't freewheeling. Alright, so anyway. That's basically how the control box here works, and uh, I guess I'll give you a quick overview of this thing running its uh, running it, running its works here. Let's see what we can do. We'll move this table around a little bit. Won't we? So this lever is up and down. This lever is this way, and this lever is for the table. Um, and then this lever breaks this functionality. Actually, the whole table, I believe, even the left and right. It's basically an emergency. You can pull this up, and it, everything will stop. It allows you to switch and configure stuff, and then release it, and uh, keep on going. These are locks for the table. I believe there's also locks here for this axis. Um, and then here are your your table speed selectors. Okay, so it's uh, inches per minute. Now the thing is, is this all changes per what the big motor in the back is running. But I've cal uh, calibrated the back motor to run exactly what it's supposed to, so those numbers will be accurate. There's a potentiometer right there, that little bitty thing. And that potentiometer actually adjusts the top and maximum frequency that that drive is seeing. Um, I can make it go faster or slower, but I've got it rated at what it is so it runs uh, at the right rates for all of these. And the same thing for all the functionality on the side over here. Which, this over here is only for the 
horizontal cutter, not the vertical one. So basically, that's my speed selectors. Now, this is my, okay, in the center, it does nothing. In reverse, it changes the direction of these two travels and this travel. Same thing with this, it goes the opposite direction. So, let me just set this up and uh, I'll run it for you. Pretty, it's a pretty awesome piece of machinery. Mainly because the table's all automated. I guess I gotta e stop it. Turn it on. Ooh, it cooled off, but man, it's been hot this week. It's been real hot. So all these float, float free. You actually have to push them in and get them set. Then you can operate it manually. Or, I can just put the lever and run it all by itself. And all three axes moving at once. Now if I want to go back the other way, I can do one lever. Or, this lever, left and right, but I have to switch that other lever to make it go full reverse on the, the other two tables. So let's slow it down. This is as slow as it will move. Now, by con configuring the speed of the back motor, I can change this. You see how slow it's moving? Okay. But I can change that with this one. I'll bring it all the way down and we'll bring it all the way up just to show you how, how far it will travel. It goes real nice. It's really easy to move. But the up and down manually it needs to be oiled. It's stiff. Now these will shut off automatically. The forward and reverse here, the table axis this way, um, will automatically shut off one way, but the bracket's missing for the other side. But the up and down's got all these stock limits already on there. This lever, like I said, is the emergency when it stops. It just disengages this gear. It goes down a lot further than I thought it did. I thought the units, and all it's still got to make the most of it is stop. I haven't bottomed it out yet. It just automatically stop. So that's a that's a good amount of travel. Let's uh, let's measure. It. Thirty one inches to that point. Now let's bring it back up. Really, that's just 
just an emergency stop. The maximum travel limits usually won't actually make it that far.
So there you go. It's kind of a demonstration overview here. different gears so I can tighten them. So there you go. That is the Cincinnati number two mill running under its own power, running on a single phase 220 input. I'd say that's a pretty sweet jobby there. It's a big old thing. Concrete isn't doing anything, it's just sitting there. All right, well, that's been a fairly lengthy video, but uh, I wanted to get it all in there for you and show you the mill and show you that it's working so now I can use it. I don't have any big plans to mill anything but I'm going to use it as a drill press. Um, I got some stuff to drill so that'll be handy in its own right. Woo! I'm going to turn fans back on. It's hot out here. Peace and love to you guys. Have a good day. RWG Research is my website and my name's Russ. Peace. Ah, what's up guys? I am back. Check it out. This thing actually goes pretty pretty far the other way. I didn't go that whole direction. So that's at another how many inches? Let's find out. Another five inches, four and a half inches. So this table actually moves. Oh boy a lot further than on my stick longer than three feet that's pretty crazy um, so I wanted to show you guys something very interesting there's probably more about this machine that I don't know but uh, this little window here was busted and there wasn't any oil in here and what this does is lubricates the system. Now I found this very interesting. There's there's one there and there's one here. I'm going to show you the one here um, because if I do that one the oil will run down in places and drip and I don't want it to drip in places. Basically before you use it I think somewhere on here I don't have enough light. That's the clutch adjustment. Here you go keep filled with good machine oil uh, uh, oh on the other side alright so that must be the pump oil that comes in the bottom down here and gets cycled around and then here uh, to oil motor yeah there's fittings on the motor that's drain the reservoir alright then it says oil daily uh, see this it says number two the way this is laid out actually isn't even with the head on it so that's kind of interesting but here it says push levers three times twice daily so there's a lever here and here so there's one there 
and then the one I showed you on the other side. Um, and this is a little daily, which is this one, and there's one on the other end. So, really quickly, let me show you something very fascinating. First of all, let's get here where we can see this. You see these maze of, of fitting pipes and fittings? It's almost like they're molded into the machine. See them? They just kind of come and go out of nowhere here. Now, what that is, is inside here there's a spring on this and it pumps fluid through these hoses. And it actually pumps fluid for the surfaces. So here and here. But let me let me show you this one real quick. I'll pull this out. So you pull it out and then it it creeps back in. And as it creeps back in, it's actually pushing fluid into the system. When the top one up there was dry, See, I filled this one up just a little. It actually needs more. It's actually... Uh, no, I may have filled it up all the way. Anyway, um, when I pumped that one on the other side, stuff started running out of the sides, which is oil. That's good. And out of the where the... Uh, um, I don't know what that's theoretically called. The Acme thread here. Where that comes out of. So the edge is here and here. Now... I saw this a while back and didn't know what it was. If you look really closely, let's see if I can get a tiny bit of light there. You see that groove that's cut into that channel? That groove actually flows, the oil actually flows through that groove and feeds it underneath this surface between these two points right here. The same thing with these two points and the two points you know where the axis slides on but uh, yeah I found that really cool so you just pull it back like that and let it go you're supposed to do that three times and you're supposed to do it twice during a day which you know that's if you're machine machining stuff all day long um, yeah anyway something I found quite fascinating this groove right here is probably, this groove is probably under there and the same thing in the back. I'm sure those probably are grooved like that too. There's the uh, good machining oil inlet which I need to open and look in and uh, obviously that stuff flows back down here and gets pumped back up this tube and out and about to the end and that's where it all actually drains all the inside cuts are actually cut so the oil drains and it drains to the center then it drains down the back and somehow makes its way through the machine back down to the bottom I'm actually not quite sure where the machine oil comes back in I'm assuming it flows in this channel which you can't really see I'm not quite sure how the oil gets back to the base, but it obviously runs down everything to get back there. Anyway, the self-oiling jigamabobber here I found a little bit fascinating. You can see how shiny it is. You can see, you can actually see my camera. See my fingers? It's pretty shiny, the oil on there. Anyway, I found that pretty cool, and I thought I'd show it to you. And I have been using it to, I actually cut a plastic front for here and then ended up just cutting some thin film sheet. Hopefully the oil doesn't attack it and it lasts, otherwise the oil is going to all run all over the floor, which is okay I guess. I got some oil dry. See how the oil is running out because I, I dumped a whole bunch in the oil daily here. Probably hadn't been oiled in who knows how long those guys at the shop probably never ever ever even touched these knobs. Probably didn't know what they were. I'm going to try to get some of this gunk out of here. Maybe it'll slide even better. But yeah, I found that kind of uh, kind of interesting. Thought I'd share it with you. Alright, video over. Peace out. Alright, <clears throat> I'm ready to go. Flipping that switch, baby. 
Ah, I got this hooked up. I got the power supply to enable and disable the drive, hooked up to a switch, also to the ramp. And the drive is temporarily hooked up directly. And then I've got a power wire coming from the panel over here. It's a mess. Don't look at it. 30 amp breaker. I believe that's 10 gauge wire. Might be 12. So, let's open this up. And uh, let's just see if it works. I'll just set this down. I'm just going to go over here and flip this switch to see if it turns on. way too fast but I guess it might not be let's get out the tachometer and see what RPM we got hey I'm so excited right now I'm running my mill for the first time all right we'll get the tack out and see what speed that was all right let's start this up and see what we got RPM wise got a piece of tape on there Let's we'll start it up. It just sounds like it's moving way too fast. Yeah, it's running like twice the speed as it's supposed to. It's at 26, 48. Slow that down. Let's try this one. All right, so I can adjust that top speed.
1750, 1749. We'll pump it up. I'd rather run a little fast than a little slow. Alright, we'll let it run, but this capacitor has to balance out. And it will change. Yeah, that's pretty good. Let's say we put the belts on and see if it runs. See my si signal running here. So I'll disable it. I'm going to kill the breaker. Put the belts on. horsepower motor, baby. Yeah. It's a nice day out here. It's raining. Got the door open. It's raining. Feels great. This diode. This is the last part. That's it. Let's put it in. See if this thing works. Mo at least a month straight worth of dedication on trying to make this thing function right. So, oh, back on the knees. That was it. That was the last piece. We're about to find out what happens. Whew! Alright. I have not tested anything yet. This plug, this outlet, which is why I'm going to mount on the wall later. But I'm going to leave this cord on it in case I need. Alright! Let's get you a different angle of view and see if we can make this work. I'll give you a quick o overview before everything blows up. It's my control box. Um, I mounted it over here. It's just, it's just hanging on by one screw so I can see if it all functions and if it works then I'll button her up. Here's the box with everything in it. It doesn't look like much but there's a crap ton of stuff going on in this little box. And, of course, I haven't cleaned up anything, so I have just been go, 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 go. So, where shall I set you? <laughs> Alright. Got everything working. It's been many of hours from last time. I redid some stuff on my circuit board in here changed some things, manipulated some stuff, and I'm finally ready and satisfied. We'll button this cover up and uh, turn it on.
There you go. It works. Satisfied so far. A few minor things to work out. Power supply there. Other than that, these bad boys are running. And I'm tired. Alright, I gotta go inside. Take care of my children. Woo woo! See you guys shortly.